throughout a woman's lifetime, calcium, vitamin D, nutrition, estrogen, and exercise are important at every stage in a woman's life to help prevent osteoclastic <coughs> overactivity. And we talked uh, the other day about hypothalamic amenorrhea. We talked about the young woman. And what happens in the young woman to produce osteoclastic overactivity? Again, here, estrogen is very important, but also protein. Protein, calorie, malnutrition is one of the big causes of osteoporosis in the good young women population. So whenever the woman comes into your office, young woman, just premenopausal woman, you're going to say to her one of your standard questions, how are your menstrual periods doing? Because amenorrhea, as we talked about, is the big predictor of problems. It's an early predictor of bone problems in the young woman. Because estrogen going down is one of the things that causes osteoclast activity to go up. And I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about a very new problem that's just come up. And we know now in patients who use opioids, in young women who use opioid therapy, 25% of those people have hypothalamic amenorrhea. They may just start out having irregular periods. So very important. Anybody you see coming to your office on opioids. And I don't know about you guys, but you know about a third of the people who come to my office are in Norco. Goodness knows for what. I mean, they're perfectly ordinary people who hurt their back or had a tooth cold or something. So remember those people. The opioids are a big problem in a lot of ways, but they're certainly a problem with osteoclast overactivity. As soon as that woman has irregular periods, she is losing bone. So remember that one. It causes a problem with hypothalamic pituitary renal communication in patients. So even if they're not amenorrhoidic, they're having a menstrual problem, they're probably having bone loss. Also, I mean, we talked about hypothalamic amenorrhea. The problem is that most of these people are malnourished. And anorexia is one of the key problems in the United States that cause bone loss in young people. So you're going to need estrogen, and you're going to need an adequate amount of protein, calcium, and vitamin D. Now, I also uh, um, the unofficial endocrinologist for Fort Hood, which is the largest army base in the free world, and you'd be amazed the number of young women who are now not only training, but are in combat. The number of young women who've had uh, significant injuries, have problems with nutrition. And again, when you see these people, they're depressed, they've had traumatic brain injury, they're not eating well, and that also is going to cause them to have irregular menstrual periods. Malnutrition, lack of estrogen, osteoclast overactivity. So the young woman, that's what we're looking at. We know in the postmenopausal woman, you've lost estrogen, and you're unfortunately uh, never going to get your endogenous estrogen back. So that in itself causes rapid osteoclast overactivity and significant loss of bone. Sometimes as much as 30% of the skeleton is lost during menopause. So again, very important to have calcium, vitamin D, nutrition, and exercise, because all of those four things decrease the rate at which your perimenopausal and postmenopausal woman loses bone. She doesn't have enough calcium, she doesn't exercise, she's going to lose bone faster. And finally, as you get older and your patients are in their 70s and 80s, osteoclast overactivity is still very important, but it is frequently mediated by increased parathyroid hormone. These people aren't taking in enough calcium. And the first day you don't take in enough calcium is the day you begin to have osteoclast overactivity. So calcium and vitamin D extremely important in the, the elderly population as uh, is watching their kidney function because renal insufficiency, remember, raises your parathyroid hormone. So in that case, we're not looking so much at estrogen loss as we're looking at deficiency in calcium and protein and vitamin D intake. So you see, as your lady passes through life, osteoporosis is always osteoclast, mediated overactivity and bone loss, but again, it's due to different factors. But remember those five things, because they're what you evaluate whenever you're looking at a patient with osteoporosis. Which of those things are a problem in those patients and which of them can be remedied. Okay, so let's take a look.
look at who to screen, how to screen, who to treat, how to treat, and how long to treat. So who to screen? These are the NOF guidelines published in 2015 and the Endocrine Society guidelines from 2017. Again, women age 65 or older, men 70 or older, that's the Endocrine Society, uh, people between 50 and 69 with clinical risk factors. Remember the people on steroids, the people with rheumatoid arthritis, and now the people with diabetes and sleep apnea. So those are the two new diseases that are inflammatory in nature that have caused people to have osteoporosis. Patients with a fragility fracture who are over the age of 50, every single one of those you need to look at because frequently they have very severe osteoporosis. Uh, women age 65 with fractures, well, the NCQA is going to get you if you don't get a DEXA scan and treat those folks. So how are we going to screen? We're going to look at bone mineral density. Well, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry makes the diagnosis for us, but you really got to look at the picture. And we're going to look at the picture today and show you how important it is. How, do, how many of you have PACs? Oh, not many of you. So, uh, you're going to have to get a picture from your radiology department. You also use the DEXA scan to monitor the effectiveness of therapy. You want to know how the patient is doing if you put them on calcium, vitamin D, you fix their malnutrition, or you put them on a bone active agent like a bisphosphonate. And in order to do that, you're going to compare the bone mineral density, not the T score. The T-score is a surrogate marker for bone mineral density. It really doesn't tell you what's going on. The radiologist should have told you about the change in bone mineral density. The uh, Society for Clinical Densitometry says that your radiology report should tell you if the patient has lost a significant amount of bone. So please, look at that report. If it doesn't tell you that, you call your radiology providing office and say, look, you will need to comply with the national standards for reporting bone mineral density. And one of those is to tell the provider whether there's been a significant bone loss or gain in this patient during the course of the time since the last DEXA scan. You're required to do that. So make sure it's done for you. You can also predict uh, the fracture risk, but only in postmenopausal women, not on bone active agents. And so, oh, gee whiz, just use fracs. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow, so I will omit that from today's lecture. Now, let's take a look at a typical DEXA scan, a typical DEXA picture. This is the spine. The spine should be straight up and down. <laughs> you shouldn't have a whole lot of osteophytes. So this person has a normal bone mineral density. Reading these is not rocket science, right? This is your patient. This is their bone density. Uh, this is green, which means they're normal. And again, yellow, little osteopenia, orange, red. So you can look at the color and actually tell how the patient is doing. But what we're looking at here to diagnose osteoporosis is the T-score. And that's the number of standard deviations your patient is above or below the young adult mean. Those standard deviations are these blocks here. So very easy to read this DEXA scan. A glance at it will tell you whether or not the patient has osteoporosis, T-score of minus two and a half or less. So you can just look at this column and look at the dot. You'll know where they are. But I want you to also notice on this DEXA scan that there is something called a Z-score. And the Z-score is the number of standard deviations or the age matched mean for your patient. So if your patient's under 50 years of age, and you want to know do they have osteoporosis, you're going to use the Z-score because the Z-score of minus two standard deviations below the age-matched mean and another diagnosis, anorexia, for example, tells you that your patient has osteoporosis and is at high risk of fracture. We see a lot of young women who have a small age range of density, but we don't have a one of the calcium deficiency, malnutrition, vitamin D deficiency, or problems with excess exercise or estrogen loss. And so those people in general are not going to have osteoclast overactivity. So you need two things to be a young person with osteoporosis. You need a Z-score, that's two standard deviations, 
or we have adult food, and you need a diagnosis that suggests that you have osteoclast overactivity. If you want, we can talk more about that tomorrow in the professor section, because you see a lot of young people with low bone mineral densities in practice. Okay, well, you know, most of my patients, now we're getting into the older age group, unfortunately don't look like the previous picture, they look like this. And so you really can't tell much from that spine. You particularly can't tell from year to year whether or not it's changed. So you can tell, you can make the diagnosis here, right? T-score, all less than minus two and a half. So the patient has osteoporosis, but if we treat her, we can't really tell much about what happened in a year or two. So to do that, generally speaking, you're gonna be looking at the hip, but please look at the hip picture. The hip has a standard position, and unlike the spine, it's not gonna be affected so much by osteoarthritis. So if we look here, the uh, femur is perpendicular. There's a little bit of a lesser trope canter. The 45 degree angle between the pelvis and the, fem and the femur is there. And this box is called the femoral neck box. And the femoral neck box should be on, all together now, the femoral neck, right? And here it is. And so that's really all I want you to look at. You take a look at this picture, you see if the femoral neck is, a box is on the femoral neck. Because if it's on the pelvis or if it's on the upper part of the femur, look at the difference between this T-score. So this can make a difference between osteoporosis that you're diagnosing incorrectly and not osteoporosis, osteopenia in your patient. So when you get this DEXA back, look at the picture. It'll tell you about the diagnosis of osteoporosis, T-score minus two and a half or lower. And it will also tell you about the accuracy of this. If you see something like this instead of something like that, you need to send it back to the radiology department and you need to put it back in and take another look. Poor neck box place, placement accounts for about 10% of the consults I get. In fact, the patient didn't have osteoporosis, they just had osteopenia, they frequently didn't need therapy, and it's just because no one looked at the picture. So, Please look at the picture. Okay, who to treat? Our goal here is to prevent fractures in patients who are at significant risk for them. It's not just to accrue bone mineral density. So some medications that we use, for example, raloxifen, really doesn't increase the bone mineral density very much, but still decreases the fracture risk. So be sure you remember that just because the bone mineral density doesn't increase significantly, doesn't mean you're not protecting the patient from fracture. Most of our medications that we're using have about a 96% chance of preventing <coughs> fractures in the patient if they take it consistently. Doesn't matter if the bone mineral density goes up a lot. And uh, again, fracture we're going to talk about tomorrow, but it's a worldwide database that was developed by the World Health Organization and Dr. John Candace so that it looks at risk factors and helps us to use them to predict 10-year outcome in terms of fracture for our patients. <laughs> and it just takes the standard, well-known risk factors and allows us to use them to calculate fracture risk. Now, there are some problems with fracts. Again, I don't know if we're gonna have time for those tomorrow, so I'll whiz through them, but basically it underestimates risk for people who still have estrogen on board. The early, the perimenopausal person, the early menopausal person is gonna underestimate the risk for those people. You need to get a DEXA scan. Frax may be used with or without a DEXA scan, but for these young people, you need to get the DEXA scan. You need to estimate the risk using the DEXA and their risk factors, not the risk factors for the DEXA alone. It's not accurate if the patient's been on bone active agents because, heck, I hope I decrease the risk of fracture in the people I put on bone active agents, right? So the uh, algorithm using risk factors is not going to work anymore. It also underestimates people who have matrix problems. Remember, the bone has mineral, it has matrix to support the mineral. If the matrix is aberrant, then the DEXA can't tell because it only looks at calcium, so it only looks at bone mineral. 
So uh, we're going to take a look, and it, it underestimates people with type 2 diabetes because they have matrix problems. Okay, so let's take a look at what the DEXA does for us. Remember that normal is a T-score of down to minus 1, minus 1 to minus 2, and a half osteopenia, minus 2 and a half, and lower osteoporosis. So that's what the DEXA tells us. It gives us a diagnosis. It gives us the indication to treat. But it doesn't measure bone strength. <coughs> and so it underestimates risk of people with diabetes who have in the bones. <laughs> they, the bones, the matrix is poorly, um, poorly placed, and so it's much more flexible. It gets more easily, and so those people fracture more easily. It underestimates the risk of obstructive sleep apnea which is an inflammatory disease, and as an inflammatory disease, it causes loss of bone. It stimulates osteoblast overactivity. Chronic renal disease, again, the DEXA scan doesn't estimate as well. Those people have a much higher risk of fracture than you estimate from the DEXA scan. And finally, it doesn't tell you what disease the patient has. If you have vitamin D deficiency, you don't mineralize, right? You have osteomalacia. When you have osteomalacia, then the bone mineral density is lower because the calcium is lower. But it doesn't really tell you that you have osteomalacia. So you don't know the patient has Paget's disease, the patient can have osteomalacia or osteoporosis. It doesn't give you the disease. This osteoporosis diagnosis in the World Health Organization is simply based on fracture disc. So it gives you the it tells you the patient with a T-score of minus two and a half has a much higher fracture risk than the patient with a T-score of minus one, but it doesn't tell you if they have vitamin D deficiency. So remember, that's a separate entity that you have to look for. Now, who to treat? In the United States, we have this quandary, because Mary Jo falls in her kitchen, fractures her hip, and goes to the hospital, and we think, gosh, um, Mary Jo has a really significant problem. She has an increased risk of fracture, obviously, since she broke her hip. And so we're going to treat her. So the NOF set up a separate set of treatment guidelines because she may have a T-score of minus 1.2, but she broke her hip. And so we're going to treat her. In the United States, we have a dichotomy between the diagnosis of osteoporosis and the therapy. Everywhere else in the world, they say, if Mary Jo fractured her hip by falling on the kitchen floor, that's a fragility fracture, she has osteoporosis. That's the diagnosis. It's very simple. In the United States, partly because of insurance changes, we don't say that. We say, oh, Mary Jo had a fracture. And what I suggest to you is, that, does Mary Jo need the DEXA to tell us about osteoporosis? Yes, no? No. We know. She fell on her kitchen floor and broke her hip. So she had a fragility fracture. She has, by the European definition and by what should be our definition, osteoporosis. We do not need a DEXA scan of Mary Jo to treat her. So the treatment guidelines are different from the diagnosis guidelines in the United States. But don't let that bother you. If a patient has had a hip or vertebral fragility fracture, if they have any other kind of fracture in a low bone mass, T-score of minus 1.2, with a fracture, we're going to treat them. And I would suggest you call them osteoporosis with the insurance company so that you and the uh, DEXA people will be paid. T-score of minus two and a half, obviously osteoporosis, low bone mass, and a secondary cause that's related, that's related to a high risk of fracture. That, in the United States, is usually steroids, steroids, and steroids. But it can also be, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes. So again, you can treat people without, if you're worried, you don't have to put osteoporosis in the chart, I generally do, but you can, these are treatment guidelines and you shouldn't uh, miss treating people just because their T-score seems to be higher than one is two and a half. Something happens to them, you treat them. Low bone mass also, a 10 year risk of hip fracture, probability of 3% or greater, or a 10-year major osteoporotic fracture probability of greater than or equal to 20%. Major osteoporotic fracture being virtually any other large bone fracture in the hip. So you can use FRAX 
to determine whether or not you want your feet. That's how you need to do it for the osteopenia people. Say you got a dexastan, Mary Jo, T score is minus 1.8 at the hip. And you said, oh gosh, should I treat this person? Should I not? Well, FRAX is going to tell you. You put them into the FRAX calculator, and if their hip probability is greater than or equal to 3%, or if their 10 year major osteoporotic fracture probability is equal to or greater than 20%, you're going to treat those people. Regardless of their T score, regardless of their DEXA, you're going to treat them. Okay, so let's take a look at diabetes and bone. And we know that diabetes results in a decreased bone mineral density and that the hip fracture rate in type 1 diabetics is up to seven times the age matched risk of people without type 1 diabetes because they have malnutrition. How many of your patients with type 1 diabetes have menstrual irregularities? They're uncontrolled, they frequently do. So they've got two of those problems. They have malnutrition, they have lower estrogen, they have some hypochlorite component uh, to their menstrual irregularity, and so as a result, they have a much higher risk of hip fracture. You don't think of that in the 20, 22, 36-year-old lady. You need to begin to think about that. Type 2, premenopausal, six times the risk of fracture of people who don't have type 2 diabetes and are the same age and have the same other risk factors. So type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, very important diseases that cause osteoporosis. That's not what the mechanisms we've discussed. The bone quality is also poor due to the glycosylation of the matrix. So the higher the A1C, the A1C is the key, the higher the A1C in a patient with diabetes, the more likely they are to have bone disease and the more likely they are to have fractures. So just remember, uh, insulin causes bone building, but these people may have malnutrition, neuropathy, sarcopenia, and particularly in the type 2 diabetic, neuropathy leading to muscle mass loss is a big risk factor for osteoporotic fracture. Okay, so let's go on here to how to treat. We're gonna remember to use calcium and vitamin D in virtually everyone. And people say, oh, okay, you know, does that cause heart disease? When these articles come flowing out, all I say is our phone rings off the hook and people say, okay, this calcium you're giving me is gonna just cause my heart to have problems. It's gonna all get into my coronary arteries. No, it's not. Uh, luckily, calcium intake is not related to, to coronary artery calcification. And we know that calcium intake is not related to cardiovascular disease. Huge studies. Uh, Women's Health Initiative, seven year follow up, no association with cardiovascular events. Here's this health study uh, more than 1,000 milligrams a day. And they had people in general 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, no association with cardiovascular death, stroke, or myocardial infarction. And finally, National Institutes of Health Diet Study no association with cardiovascular disease in women. So this is a huge study. This bottom one has over 200,000 patients followed for 12 years. It's a very powerful observational study. So tell your patients it's okay to take your calcium and your vitamin D. It's not gonna clog your coronary arteries. And finally, if you wouldn't want to been on this panel at all, meta-analysis of all the articles from 1966 to 2013 that looked at calcium and coronary artery disease and showed that there was not a relationship to cardiovascular events in the amount of calcium that we suggest people take, which is 1,000 to uh, 1,200 milligrams a day. Dietary calcium is best. The bottom line of this slide is really the bottom line in everybody's practice we possibly can. When you say, oh, where the heck is calcium? Dairy products, you'll say, I have lactose intolerance. Aha, soy milk. Uh, all of the alternative milks are fortified with calcium. No, they don't come with calcium, but they're fortified. So you can use those. Well, there are a lot of drinks that are fortified. And remember, leafy green vegetables. I know you guys think Brussels sprouts are poisonous, but they aren't. You know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, spinach, all have calcium. A cup of cooked green vegetables, those green vegetables, 
of 300 milligrams of calcium. So your patient likes green vegetables, and if they can eat dairy products, alternative forms of milk, all of those have calcium, and they're not as constipating as taking calcium carbonate supplements, which most people take. Okay, how much vitamin D? Well, National Academy of Sciences says 600 IVs for under 71 and 800 IVs for over 71. I don't know what the 71 is. <laughs> 71 seems to be the breaking point here. But the USDA has a much more reasonable thought, and they say more than 4,000 IVs a day is not recommended. And I don't know about you, but my patients come in to their 20-minute visit and they have this huge bag of supplements, and they say, they dump them out of my desk, and they say, gosh, um, here they are. I say, well, how much calcium are you taking? Oh, I don't know. So how much, we don't know. Okay, so you have to go through those. But please do, go through them. Because I have people who are taking 10,000 international units of vitamin D a day. It is a fat-soluble vitamin. It hangs around, and you can get toxicity. So unless you are depleting a vitamin D deficiency, you really don't want more than 4,000 IUs a day. And they're diff that's difficult to obtain from dietary sources, unless you're a real fan of mushrooms. So again, um, people say to me, why measure vitamin D anyway? How many of you just tell people to take 2,000 or 4,000 IUs a day? If you live in the south, that may be okay. If you live in the north and it's winter, you're gonna miss a bunch of people with D deficiency by just telling them to take a couple thousand IUs a day. So insurance companies are getting a little sticky about measuring vitamin D, but remember that vitamin D deficiency or osteomalacia actually gives you bone pain. How many people got in your practice with aches and pains? Lots of people in my practice. So again, take a look. I, as a matter of fact, of the I spoke to the, this is a mistake, but I spoke to the fibromyalgia support group. And, <laughs> yeah. and I said, well, you know, yes, vitamin D deficiency, and not a tingly little vitamin D insufficient, vitamin D deficiency can actually cause bone and muscle pain. Well, the next day, I had 40 calls to my office about vitamin D deficiency. So careful if you speak to those folks. But you can actually, I cured two cases of fibromyalgia. So, have you ever done that? No, okay. Okay, so again, osteomalacia is an increased risk of fractures, increased parathyroid problems. We said in elderly patients, increased PTH is one of the big reasons for fracture. Decreased serum calcium and phosphorus, and vitamin D therapy is the cure, and it's really an easy cure. So let's take a look at all of the various thoughts about what the heck is vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency. We know that vitamin D uh, deficiency actually causes fractures, bone pain, etc. Vitamin D insufficiency, we don't know. So it comes and goes. This year, it's gone. And the <laughs> Institutes of Medicine said, oh heck, you know, uh, under 20 we ought to treat uh, in terms of nan uh, nanograms per mil. Uh, 20 to 30, oh, if they're healthy and they don't have osteopenia or osteoporosis, you really don't have to treat that, and above 30 is normal. So why do we worry about 20 to 30? Because about 3 to 30 percent, this is a little variable on two studies, of people who have elevated PTH reside in that 20 to 30 level. So if you have elevated PTH, is that bad for you? We need to treat you, we need to get you vitamin D deplete. So if your patient has osteoporosis, you want them to be in the 30 to 40 range, which the Institute of Medicine, the Endocrine Society, say is the ideal place. You want them between about you know, 20 to 40 if they're healthy people, over 30 if they have bone disease. So, and that's the, this year's thought. Next year, probably different. Those are the references. Okay, who are we gonna screen? Well, since the insurance company isn't paying us to screen everybody, we probably ought to pick out a few people. Patients who don't respond to bisphosphonate initially, usually that we're treating osteomalacia. Bisphosphonates don't treat osteomalacia well. Only vitamin D treats osteomalacia. 
Patients who have non-union fractures frequently have a problem with osteomalacia. They're not healing properly because they're not mineralizing properly. Young people with a fracture at any site, young people should fracture. People under the age of 30, unless they are on motorcycle accidents or you know, automobile accidents, they shouldn't have fragility fractures. People who are obese have decreased production of 25D and also active D. So you probably want to take a look at them, particularly your obese pregnant lady. She is definitely going to need to have you look at her vitamin D status. Particularly she's had bariatric surgery. Virtually all those people are vitamin D deficient and the vast majority of them have osteomalacia. Anybody with rapid turnover, your older patients who have Paget's disease, which is a rapid bone turnover disease. Anybody who has had any kind of malabsorptive surgery, so bariatric surgeries with gastric bypass, the people with bands you don't need to look at, the people with sleeves, not a problem, but by gastric bypass, the ruin Y bypass or the switch bypass, those need to be looked at. How do you replace D? Well, if you're just a few uh, nanograms per mil off, you can use 1,000 to 2,000 IUs a day. But if they really have significant deficiency, you need to use that really old-fashioned 50,000 IUs of D2 once a week for eight weeks. We could all say that in our sleep, right? Recently, insurance companies are not paying so well for the 50,000 in the national unit vitamin D2 tablet. So can you use D3? It's more potent. So you're not gonna need quite so much. Yes, if you have people take a 10 or 4,000 IU tablets of D3 a week, you can do it. D3 has a very long half-life, so you can actually tell them to take all 10 at the same time. It's very well absorbed. But I, in my practice, we, most people won't take 10 extra pills a week. So I do try to get their 50,000 IUs of D funded. And how many of you have people that are you know, you do it on this 50,000 units for eight to 12 weeks, and you waited a, week, a month, and then you measured. And they started out at 14, and now they're 16. Anybody experienced that, unfortunately? Yes, okay. Well, that is because uh, when Hollick did this study, the average BMI in the United States was about 23 <coughs> in 1998. Now the average BMI is about 34, and vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so your larger people are going to need much more D in order for you to get their stores depleted. So don't give up, just keep going. Okay, so let's take a look at how to, how to treat osteoporosis. Um, those are the list of approved medications. We're not going to talk about raloxin and vasodoxin. If you have questions about that, be happy to answer them. They do work. They have limited utility. Uh, bisphosphonates, PKH-134, denosumab, and a phalloparatide is just out the door when we talk a little bit about those. Uh, calcitonin, the only thing we need to say about it is have an FDA warning for increased malignancy. People who take calcitonin have about twice the risk of liver cancer. You see yourself writing this prescription. Okay, Mrs. Jones, this stuff doesn't work very well. Uh, it doesn't prevent hip fracture. You have to blow it up your nose, and it causes cancer. But you can go right out and get this. Right. So I, I can't see myself writing that prescription, and the FDA says if you do, you've got to discuss the malignancy risk, and you need to see if you can do anything else than calcitonin. And now there are multiple things you can do, so just wipe it off your armamentary. Alendronate, you know, all know about alendronate. It's approved for everything. It's been around for, oh, well over 10 years, and they applied for their new uh, PI. You have to do that every so often with the FDA. And the FDA said, oh, you know, we don't know how long to use this stuff. We really don't. And at low risk for fracture, cons consider discontinuing after three to five years. Oh, they were chagrined. Uh, the people who make this were chagrined. But this is still the most commonly used therapy for osteoporosis. Decreases hip fracture by about 50%, decreases spinal fracture by over 80%, works in nine to 12 months. Really good drug. Don't just uh, pass on it. It works. Lisandronate and abandronate are also bisphosphonates. Uh, they are more expensive. Abandronate is now generic, but insurance companies, for some reason, still don't have these reasonably priced. And the joy of them is you can take them once a month. 
but generally speaking, it's much more expensive for the patient, and eliminate the works just as well. How do you use zeledronic acid? A couple of them. Okay. Well, zeledronic acid is our most potent bisphosphonate, and it's once a year IV therapy. It's approved again for everything. Really, before you use any bisphosphonate, and particularly before you use zeledronic acid, you've got to ask about your calcium and vitamin D. Is the calcium level normal? Is the vitamin D level replete? You get terrible bone pain if you give this to people with vitamin D deficiency. So you have to ask that. You need to know their creatinine. So you need the vitamin D, the calcium, and the creatinine before you treat anyone with any one of our osteoporosis agents. Make sure you get those straight. You also need to know if they're malnourished, because again, it's not going to do as well if they're malnourished have vitamin and calcium disorders. Okay, so let's take a look at denosumab. How many, anybody use that? Okay, very good. Uh, denosumab or prolia is really very handy because you can use it in patients with renal insufficiency. They comprise about 30% of my practice in osteoporosis. And again, all the indications are there. It's 60 milligrams sub-Q and it comes in a pre-filled syringe. So it's really easy to use in your office. And you can use it in renal insufficiency, but you have to monitor the calcium very carefully. It's contraindicated in hypocalcemia, pregnancy, and hypersensitivity. Pregnancy is tough. You have osteoporosis and a fracture in pregnancy. Um, if you have a question about that, I can help you out, but it's really, it's really tough to do. The problem with this, and the reason it, they said you can, it's, it's for higher risk patients, it was approved for patients with high risk of fracture, is it has a heck of a lot of side effects. Most people don't get them, but you have to discuss the fact that you can get significant infections. If your patient has UTIs or bronchitis several times a year, they may get that more often on the denosumab. If they have skin problems, they are likely to exacerbate on denosumab. But psoriasis, plus minus, but atopic eczema, oh, they're liable to get skin reactions. So ask them if they get a lot of rashes. If they do, this may not be the drug for them. You get severe muscle and bone pain. Seldom happens. Again, make sure calcium and vitamin D are in order. And the creatinine with this one is important as well. Because if you have stage three or four renal disease, then you can get a PTH elevation that happens for a while increases bone turnover, and hypocalcemia can be terrible on those people. I, I tell my patients that uh, you never want to give a bisphosphonate to the hypocalcemic person, because what do bisphosphonates do? Well, they actually shut off the bone a bit. They, uh, they take the active osteoclast and sort of kill it earlier. <coughs> so that's what the bisphosphonate does. So it's a little harder to get calcium out of your bones. Now, my patients, it's kind of like the bank. If you're on a bisphosphonate, the main bank is closed, but you can go to the ATM. So you can, you can still mobilize calcium from bone on a bisphosphonate, but not easily. If you look at denosumab or prolia, not only does it cause the osteoclast to have a shorter half-life, you get fewer osteoclasts because it stops them from differentiating, it stops them from becoming multi-nucleus giant cells, it just stops them in their tracks. And so not only is the main bank closed, the ATM is closed, you cannot get calcium out of your bones. So you must take your calcium. If you have patients on denosumab, they have to take their calcium. I had a lady who stopped her calcium for five or six days because she wasn't feeling well. Went to the ED. Calcium went from 9.2 to 7.4. 7.4 is a bit calcium. She had cramps. She had carpal spasm. So again, on the osmia, you're using a big push for the patients, explain to them they have to take their calcium every day or they can get very hypocalcemic. So that's the biggest side effect. How long to treat? Oh gosh. This phosphonates are a hard act to follow, but everybody's treated worldwide. There's a 90% responder rate. We went over this 50% decrease in hip fracture and Risk of hip fracture in the United States is 750 to 830 per 100,000 people. Hip fracture is a very big problem in the United States, and recently it's gotten to be a worse problem because people are afraid to use bisphosphonates. Okay, please don't be afraid to use bisphosphonates. 
but it was one thing we learned during this lecture. Is they're safe for five years of use. What's the risk of atypical fractures? About after five years, about 16 to 100,000. Before five years, virtually none. So you got five-year window here, and five years new things are going to be out. So not to worry, just start them off. After nine years, it goes up to about 113 to 100,000. Well, I see people coming to my office who have been on bisphosphonates for 15 years. That's how long they've been out. You know, please, after about five years, you take a look at your people on bisphosphonates and say, gosh, does Mary Jo really need to continue to? So three to five years, take a look. This is the only decent study that's been doing this from Dell. It's a retrospective study on the Kaiser Permanente data. Okay, so how about bone suppression anyway? Well, the FDA said to the Silicon acid people, I said, okay, you're the last guys out. Tell us about bone suppression. Tell us about these people and their risk for atraumatic fractures. Who's at risk? Tell us about them. So they did. We used to think it was only kind of people who were behind the eight ball. You know, some people had funny risk factors and they were going to get atraumatic fractures. And look at this. By month 36, average dose of zoledronic acid, everybody had a reduction in bone formation, because now we could measure bone-specific bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. And bone-specific alkaline phosphatase really wasn't available when we first started looking at this phosphatase, but it's a bone-building marker. And, and the FDA said, that's a really good one now. We can look. Everybody who put on this phosphatase gets some degree of bone suppression. <coughs> so who are the people that are going to fracture? Well, 70% of the people who are going to fracture have bone pain. You say, oh, my patients have aches and pain. No, 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 it's bone pain in the fingers. Like, oh, my fingers, my bone hurts, my body hurts. And they have it for quite a long time. It's dull, it's aching, it doesn't go away, it doesn't matter whether they exercise or not, it's still there. And they have a localized periosteal reaction in the cortex. You can get an x-ray and see this. I'll show you in a second. But the comorbid conditions, yes, we can tell people who have vitamin D deficiency, people who have rheumatoid arthritis, people who are on steroids, people who have diabetes, people who have other risk factors for fracture are going to have, more likely to have this. So you know, on this phosphate. So what does it look like? The radiologist knows, and I think I showed you this picture last year, so we all get it right here, less fracture. They're like stress fractures. Stress fractures are particularly in com common in people who are not on enough calcium. So you got all those little athletic runners, those postmenopausal ladies who are exercising. Calcium is really important to prevent stress fractures. And these people who have been on this phosphate a long time and don't take their calcium again, they're much more likely to have atraumatic fractures who fracture at the site of the stress line. But the radiologist can see it when it's here. <laughs> so you don't have to wait list here. Okay, so what are we going to do? And this data hasn't changed this year. It says if you have no prevalent fracture, if your patient has not had a fracture, then if they still have osteoporosis at three to five years, you're going to continue their bisphosphonate because their risk of fracture, if you stop it, is greater, much, much greater than their risk of fact fracture if you keep on. Women with prevalent fractures, if they have osteoporosis down here at the bottom, or if they're minus two, minus two and a half, so severe osteopenia, you're still going to continue again. You only have to treat 17 people to prevent a fracture. If they're above two, you can stop. If they have no prevalent fracture and no osteoporosis anymore, you can stop and take a drug follower. So again, those people, you can stop. So no prevalent fractures, no osteoporosis, you can stop. Prevalent fractures, you really have to wait till the T-score is above minus T. And this is the latest. This came out in January 2016. And the only difference here in this entire review, and this is a review that's compiled by Adler, the Bone and Mineral Society had them look at every single study they could. They looked at everybody's data. The previous slide looked at a lender data. But this looks at everybody's data. And the only new thing that it came up with is that if you have had a fracture, you want to treat for five years after that to make sure the patient is protected from a second fracture. 
That was the only new thing she came up since June uh, last year. Okay, so when is the holiday over? Well, uh, you can go to the DEXA scan, and the insurance company will let you do DEXAs every year if the patient is on therapy. But I mean, you have that waiver that comes up. If you don't have a waiver that comes up on your, how many of you have an EPIC waiver? If you don't, you talk to your administrator because they, uh, it'll come up and they'll say, you can't have this DEXA, uh, the little sign that says not indicated. But if you have the waiver form, you can actually go in and click waiver, you click triggered, notice triggered, and then you click appointment made. <laughs> There's some thing that says appointment confirmed, appointment made, and that tells them that the patient is on a bone active agent and gives you the Medicare okay to get that DEXA scan in the year. So if you have people on a bone active agent, you can get the DEXA scan in the year. Okay, so that's the best way to look. If you have a statistically significant change, decrease in the bone mineral density when the patient is off for a year, then, or two years, depending on how you and the insurance company look at the picture, then uh, you can restart the medication. It's a good idea to restart. And again, the radiologist should tell you, it should be on the report. You shouldn't have to look at the picture to find out that there's been a statistically significant decrease in the bone mineral density in your patient on that particular scanner. Be sure to have your patients get their decks on the same scanner every year. You can't compare scanner to scanner to look for differences in bone mineral density. Okay, for the last few minutes, let's talk about teriparatide. Let's talk about anabolic agents. Teriparatide, or Forteo is its name, is the only anabolic agent that was approved for osteoporosis until about three weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, it's a direct stimulator of osteoblasts, so it tells the osteoblast to go forward. Remember, osteoporosis is osteoclastic overactivity, but we're looking here at stimulating the bone building cells directly, rather than waiting for them to be coupled with bone loss. It decreases spinal fractures, it's approved for two years of use because of osteosarcoma <coughs> in rats. And in fact, now they are 13 years out uh, with this drug, and the FDA said they had to report for 15 years if anyone got an osteosarcoma on Forteo. And so far, after 13 years, no one has, no human has got an osteosarcoma on Forteo. People are beginning to use it off-label again for longer than two years with certain criteria. But it looks like it's a very expensive way to kill rats. Which brings us to the point that it's incredibly expensive, and that's the worst side effect of Forteo, incredibly expensive. It uh, is useful in severe osteoporosis, a T-score of minus three, lots of fractures, collapsing lots of spine uh, vertebra, then you can use Forteo first. Generally speaking, you're using it when patients have been on bisphosphonates for too long. It gets bone moving again. We know that, it's, again, off-label, it's not approved by the FDA for that. It heals those fractures, the uh, atraumatic fractures, heal better on Forteo. It heals non-union fractures, again, it's all off-label, but it does a really good job. Let's see, credit, it's $1,100 a month. Ooh, right. Okay, so I want to say a couple words about OMJ. Remember that is bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. What's new here? New is the incidence in huge study now, retrospective study, in patients with osteoporosis on bisphosphonate, the incidence of OMJ is exactly the same as it is in the general population. People who have poor dental hygiene are on steroids, using high dose for cancer, diabetes, or chronic jaw infections have a higher incidence. Your average osteoporosis patient will never get this, really won't. You can diagnose it with a chronic bean CT, and they say, what is it? You know, okay, in the general course of the day, in my practice particularly, where I'm seeing a bunch of patients and they're all of osteoporosis, yeah, I might miss that. How many of you are honest to say you also might miss that? I, I probably wouldn't miss this, right? You look in their mouth. That's the other thing you really ought to do with people coming for this phosphonate therapy. And nobody's going to miss that, right? So if you're worried about this, and you have to notice it, then get the uh, CT or the MRI. Really, that's a CT report on that. Okay, 
OMJ, kind of preventive. Good oral hygiene. And if the patient, uh, you know, if the patient you're looking at now with that fifteen drop, oh, geez, I looked in the mouth the other day and I said, gosh, right. He said, this tooth is really bothering me, and I probably ought to go to the dentist, but I can't afford it. And I looked in, I thought, if I took my glove and my he had diabetes, so you never know. Um, I could have extracted that tooth, but I felt that I didn't know what to charge for that, and I can't sell it. <laughs> okay. So in the end here, what's new? Well, what's sad is um, what's new should have been anti-sclerotic, by the way. Uh, Amaloperatide is new. Just came out, as a matter of fact, it's approved about a month ago. It's PTHRP. Remember, PTHRP is made by things like renal cell carcinoma. But don't worry, it's not carcinogenic. It is just a like a PTH-like hormone that's made uh, by tumors. And so what they've done is synthesized it. It's just like teriparatide. And it's, it's the postmenopausal with osteoporosis and a high risk of osteoporotic fracture. It decreases both vertebral and non-vertebral fractures. Remember that uh, teriparatide or forteo, the study didn't go on long enough to show whether or not it decreased non-vertebral fractures. So it doesn't, maybe it doesn't help with fractures. This one does. And the same side effects, urocytic hypotension, you get some cramps, you get hypercalcemia, and it's limited to two years of use, osteosarcoma in the rat. Again, it's 80 milligrams daily. You say, why do they do this? It has the same side effects, it has the same effects. I, I can use it a little longer. Why did they bother? Millions of dollars. Ah, <coughs> bottom line, 56% less costly than teriparatides. It's relatively inexpensive. It doesn't have to be refrigerated, but it hasn't been shown to cause anaphylaxis. So it has those three advantages over teriparatide. So they're going to try and sneak in and get the business. Well, and finally, this drug is supposed to come out today. But this was at the new drug. Uh, and it is called Romozoscomab. And it's an anti sclerosis antibody. Remember, we talked last year about how women are really at a disadvantage because. Uh, when you get to menopause, your bone cells can differentiate either into osteoblasts or adipocytes. Oh, when you hit menopause, they go down the adipocyte group. Do I need more fat cells? No. Uh, you can answer that question for yourselves. So again, anti antibody is an antibody to sclerostin, which causes the differentiation into fat cells. And so we're going to stop that. And um, so you know, it complexes with sclerostin, moves it out of the way, you get more osteoblasts. Unfortunately, in the data, the FDA said there was a signal for cardiac disease. That doesn't mean that it increases cardiac disease. That means that the data was insufficient to show that it did not. And so as of today, they said, tough luck, no osteoblasts for about a year. OK, so question one. How do you decide whether to treat a patient with a bone active agent? Okay. T score of minus two and a half or lower, frac score of three percent or greater the hip, fragility fracture at age fifty or greater, and remember the petty rule here, right? Okay. If one and two are right, it's all of the above. Very good. Okay. Or any of the above. I was not preempted here. Well, you've already answered it. Uh, we we'll look at the DEXA scan. You decide if the bone mineral density has changed by looking at the O O O data. Remember, we don't look at T score, we don't look at the, at the Z score. Looking for change in bone mineral density, we look at the bone mineral density. And you look at the change in bone mineral density, and it should be on the report. Very good. Okay, so the change of answer. This is a this isn't like life. You can change your answer to these questions as you go along. Okay. Before you treat the patients with a T score minus two and a half or less of the bisphosphonate, you should check the 25 rest of D. What was it, man? Give a chance to say that any of the above. What are we three or four? There we go. There we go. Okay. Very good. Trying to get it to load. Okay, next. We're on four. Uh, osteonecrosis and geocrosis of the phosphonate and denosumab. Commonly, very rarely, unknown frequency. Either B or C is essentially normal. We know kind of, but a much less likely with denosumab, uh, we think. Okay. Okay. Another more? Okay, we're all 
most osteomyelitis is antiosteroidal antibody, uh, antibody to rank ligand, antibody to rank ligand removes tenosinib or, or proline, and a new drug for diabetes, <laughs> no, it's a new drug for osteoporosis. Okay.